Okay, welcome everyone to the series that is called What is Geometric Topology? So geometric topology is more like the study of manifolds and so on. We'll see. I mean, in this first video, I'm trying to motivate uh, what geometric topology is and what I'm going to cover in this video series. Um, basically, the slogan is that everything is a disk. So it's a disk and we'll see what it is. Um, but let's get started and then I also sketch, as I said, where we are trying to go. Um, and eventually, uh, what I have in mind is that we start very slowly. Um, of course, why not? It's like it's like a video game, right? You start very slowly and then you kind of level up or something. Uh, anyway, we start very slowly and eventually we will hit some research level questions. Um, maybe that's way too complicated for me at least, but we'll see where we can go. Okay, so geometric topology, this is my kind of my rough picture of topology. So I have a, a box outside, which is, well, it's kind of general topology, which a lot of people confuse with topology in general. So general topology is very often confused with topology in general. Uh, so it's kind of set point topology, sometimes it's with the basics, um, what is the topological space and so on. So basically, it's I think of it as a language of the rest of topology, which is in some sense real topology, whatever that means, whatever real means. Okay, let, let's ignore, let's ignore what I just said. Anyway, so I have a box outside. Uh, of course, you can see it here, which is this general topology, the language underlying topology. Uh, as I said, continuous functions and topological, topological spaces, uh, paths, uh, Tikhonov theorem, something like that. Um, and then you have three main fields of topology, uh, roughly speaking, of course. And there are huge intersections. It's quite a Venn diagram, as you can see here. Um, so you have algebraic topology, which is kind of the study of algebraic invariants associated to topology or topological object, which depends a bit how you want to interpret it. It's more part of algebra than topology itself. But okay, anyway, so it's really about combinatorial objects like uh, CW complexes or some cell complexes like, like this stuff here. Differential topology is what the name says. It's topology with some extra information. Uh, you might have a metric around or some differential structure, some smooth structure, something like that. And geometric topology, is the geometric part of topology. Just kidding. It's kind of the study of manifolds. That's what it is. And so the study of things that are locally disks. Um, so these are called manifolds. And here's an example of a manifold uh, sphere with three handles. Um, kind of the easiest non-trivial, this is certainly not the easiest non-trivial example. It's an example of a manifold. Uh, but let's actually get started and try to motivate where everything comes from. So really, the study of geometric topology is not, so geometric topology is not studying random topological spaces. There's not really much you can say about general topological spaces. That's something you should do in general topology anyway. So we're doing geometric topology and geometric topology, a very, very applicable field, by the way. So geometric topology is a study of many folds. So uh, I shortened that, of course, because it's way too long as a word. It's a mouthful. Um, and the manifold, basically speaking, roughly speaking, is just uh, something that is glued together from disks. So if you think of something like a sphere, um, you have a northern hemisphere, you have a southern hemisphere, and basically the northern hemisphere, if you ignore the rest, here is just a disk. As you can see, uh, well, maybe not because I've chosen a bad color here. So as you can see, uh, this is just a disk. So this is a D2. D is a disk and two is the dimension of the disk. So D2, and same for the Southern Hemisphere. You can find smaller disks here and you can glue them together. Here's the, again, quite a Venn diagram here. Um, and there's another disk. So this space is certainly locally made out of disks. But so is this space, which I will show you a nice uh, mathematical code that you can run yourself. Well, it's not code, it's a demonstration that you can run yourself, it's linked in the description. Uh, so this swim ring type object, sometimes called a torus, it is uh, also locally made out of disks. And you actually really can't tell locally, that's the whole point. Locally, you can't tell whether this is a flat space or not. We'll see that in a second. Um, just here as a slight remark, so the torus is not a donut. Uh, a lot of people say the torus is a donut because the torus is really more the swim ring. It's hollow inside. And I don't know what kind of donuts you like, um, but a hollow donut would be a little bit disappointing, I guess. Anyway, so people usually call it a donut. It's more like a swim ring type of object. Keep that in mind. It's really, really hollow. So there's air inside if you want. Um, another example of a manifold is your pair of pens. I hope you're wearing a pair of pens right now. If not, well, 
fine. It's, it's fine with me. But anyway, so if you're wearing a pair of pants right now, that's a manifold. And how can you check that that's a manifold? Well, if you ever had a patch on, on your pair of pants, that's your local disk. All right. So again, you have lots of local disks here on your pair of pants. So um, it's, it's a manifold. So let's zoom into the torus. So here's a nice mathematical demonstration, which is, as I said, linked in the description. So the torus is a two-dimensional object. Keep in mind, it's hollow. So there's only the surface area of the, tor of the torus. Um, and that's, well, you can parameterize it by using two coordinates. Um, and you can kind of play around here with those coordinates and it, it will move the, the greenish dot here. So we have two coordinates, which are in given in polar coordinates. So two angles, basically. And what you can do here, so this, you might not complain now, this doesn't look like a torus, neither like a, neither like a torus, nor like a donut, nor like a swim ring. Well, the point is, this is a local picture. You should really think that you are this green little ball, uh, or whatever it is, and you really can't tell whether the, whether you're uh, locally on a, on a disk or whether it's a torus. It is a torus, so let me show you that this is not just a rectangle. So if you move out here, it actually ticks back and comes back in from the other side, which is on the rectangle, a non-continuous movement, but on the torus, it's completely continuous. And same here, it ticks over, pop, and comes in on the other side. But locally, you simply can't tell whether it's a disk or not, and that's the whole point. So let me construct now the torus for you. So you can actually pull this little bar and what it does is it then constructs a torus by identifying the sides of the um, of the uh, rectangle. And this is then the torus. So here you go. Uh, that's a swim ring. And you can do the same movement on the swim ring. And it's really just the same movement. It's just locally explained or not locally. So this one, the one that was kind of going around, um, is also kind of jumping around on the rectangle. If you left it to one side, you come into the other side. It's really just this operation that you go around the torus or you go around the hole. And that's basically it. So this is the two directions. And then if you flatten it out again, locally, you really can't tell the difference. It's whatever it is, you really have no idea you can't tell the difference. And that's a manifold, right? So locally, we can't tell the difference from a disk. And by a disk, I really in the end mean a D to the N. So there might be an N-dimensional manifold. It's just a bit harder to imagine. So uh, two dimensions is, is really, really good for our brains, at least for my brain. Um, so I stick here on, on the slide with two dimensions, but eventually we'll see higher dimensional spaces. So this is kind of the outline of a classical course on geometric topology, whatever that means. Um, and basically what I'm trying to cover is extrinsic properties of manifolds, which really means you just kind of fix something additional like an embedding. So I'm going to explain knots and graphs and embeddings, basically kind of a lot of fun to begin with. And then the manifolds intrinsically, which was really my, my little torus picture was a green ball that was moving around the torus. Um, that's really intrinsically. I, 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 do, I, can't tell it, I can't tell whether it's a flat space or not as soon as I stand on it. And I need some idea how to tell that it's not a flat space. And it's usually has some really, really um, kind of sophisticated topics somehow it depends a little bit on your dimension. So construction and classification of mostly low dimensional manifolds. Uh, so I hope to get up to three and four. Um, beyond that, it's just it's just too crazy for me. Probably three and four are already too crazy for me, but we'll see. Um, in particular, in dimension three and four, there are Hega splitting, Scurby calculus, and third, certain types of Dane surgeries, Dane twists, and so on. They're very important. And then there is the famous Poincaré conjecture, which I will recall in a second, which I hope to cover somehow, um, somehow explaining even the proof and uh, the statement of, uh, or the status of the conjecture in four dimensions, uh, we'll see. And along the way, we will have some other problems um, that are related to geometric topology. So you can think of maps between manifolds. It's usually also studied in geometric topology. Um, so cobordisms, if you know what that means. If not, we'll see what these are. Mapping class groups, that's just maps between manifolds. And there's other problems related, like the unknotting problem, which is more a problem of co complexity theory than of geometric topology itself, but um, we'll see. So kind of the outline is some funny knot theory, which is 
a lot of fun, which is then uh, manifold extrinsically graphs, manifolds extrinsically. A graph is not really a manifold, but I will put it on manifolds or something. Uh, you will see an embedding, so you can ask the question, what is the smallest space I can the torus lives in? Uh, can it live in a two space? Can it live in R2? No, it can't. Can it live in R3? Well, let's have a look. There you go, it can. We have a swing ring, proof that it can live in R3. And so on. You can ask such questions for the minimal embedding or the minimal immersion, something like that, uh, or more intrinsically stuff like he got splitting the so Kirby calculus to construct manifolds in the Poincare conjecture. So you're not to construct the Poincare conjecture, so to construct manifolds, comma, and the Poincare conjecture to discuss the Poincare conjecture. So the Poincare conjecture goes back to roughly, well, roughly 120 years by now. Let's say 120 years, doesn't matter so much. And it's a question asked by Poincaré, basically is the following. So how much information do you need to detect whether you have a sphere or not? Um, and in this case, something like the three sphere. And basically the question was this, how, how much algebraic conditions do you need um, to determine whether it's a sphere? And that problem was widely open for a long time. And roughly in the 80s, 90s, probably 80s, uh, people developed tools to kind of try to well, address this Poincare conjecture, which turns out to be hardest. You can interpret this in any dimension. So you can do SN, for example. And it turns out to be hardest in dimension three. So in dimension three, it's actually the hardest. hardest part, the hardest part of the conjecture is dimension three. The rest was already known kind of in the 60s. So as I tried to say in the 80s, people developed techniques to attack dimension three, and it took about uh, 20 more years until the very famously Perlman then kind of solved it in three archive papers, which were never published, but basically the ideas were there and then people polished it. Um, that sounds a bit unfair. It's, it's, it's still non-trivial to polish it, but basically people then polished it. And nowadays it's uh, it's known. It's the projector architecture is now a theorem, whatever you want to call it, the Perlman and Kuhl theorem, if you want. Um, but then there's a funny part of topology. So as I said here in this 3D case, people from the 80s started to develop tools to prove the conjecture. So it was kind of the experts certainly agreed that the conjecture is true. A conjecture doesn't need to be true, right? Um, and depending a little bit how you interpret Poincaré, so Poincaré is not known to be, or well, certainly uh, one of the pioneers of geometric topology, but also certainly not well known to be super precise by uh, whatever is written in their papers. Um, and well, it turns out that you can interpret Poincaré's question about the, how can I detect spheres topologically, like just as a topological sphere, or smoothly, like as a smooth sphere. And it turns out that smoothly, dimension four is actually the com most complicated, not dimension three. The other dimensions are reasonably easy. And then the, you have the corresponding conjecture. How much algebraic information do we need to, to detect a smooth sphere in four dimensions, basically? And uh, well, in contrast to the three-dimensional one, which was famously solved by Poincaré, uh, by, Poincaré <laughs> by Poincaré's conjecture, by Perelman, um, the 4D case is still widely open. And it, it, it's really, really widely open in the sense that the experts don't even really agree whether it's true or false. So there are certain people who try to disprove the conjecture. There are certain people who try to prove the conjecture. And it's quite a mess. So I probably think, I have no idea. It could be solved tomorrow. I have absolutely no idea. But I would guess that it will take a while uh, to be settled if it's ever settled. So it's, it's really, really hard. So it turns out that in, in this sense, low dimensional topology, at least for this question, dimension three and four are the hardest uh, for some reasons I'm trying to cover in this video series. Anyway, so um, the unlocking problem is something very different in nature. So one problem you face with this kind of the standard definition in topology, so people always try to tell you that the torus is the same as a coffee cup, um, find that that's, that's true up to a certain, the correct notion of um, isomorphism of equivalence, but that might not be the correct notion for what you have in mind. So what is here called the homeomorphism, um, so that's usually what you study intrinsically in manifold theory, uh, would identify the standard torus versus not a torus. So if you want to do any kind of not theory, a homomorphism can't be, at least not naively, can't be the correct notion. Um, and you come up with different notions of equivalence, you kind of take the embedding into account and see what that means. 
And then the question is, how can you detect knottedness basically? Uh, for example, here is a really, really strange embedding of the unknot. It's just a circle. In the end, you can undo this picture, but it's not quite trivial. If you read along like here and you want to pause the video, I marked all the steps. It's not really trivial. And um, to kind of answer the question how hard it is to decide whether some mess that you see, some cabling of your computer cables or whatever, is really the unknot. It's called uh, the unknotting problem which actually has some very nice connections to complexity theory and so on. And I'm also hope to do, uh, cover this in this video series. Anyway, so geometric topology basically is the study of manifolds in what incarnation ever. So in, in uh, not theory, it's more like the embedding of manifolds and not theory is not necessarily restricted to uh, a circle in three space. It's just the easiest to mention. You can also, think of a knotted surface in four space or something. So knot theory is basically about embeddings, um, while kind of the rest of geometric topology, well, whatever that means actually, is also about intrinsic properties. How can you detect manifolds? How can you construct manifolds? Can you classify manifolds? A Poincaré type conjectures, which is basically trying to find a good um, algebraic notion how to detect uh, the sphere, which is the easiest non-trivial manifold, and so on. And that's kind of geometric topology. It's one of the most active and maybe one of the most prominent, the most uh, popular fields of topology. And I hope to cover at least uh, a few slices of it in this video series. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.